Von diesem geheimnisvollen Ort haben Sie sicher schon einmal gehört. Aber auch wenn es jetzt so aussieht, wir befinden uns nicht in den USA. Tatsächlich sind wir mitten in Rheinland-Pfalz. Genauer gesagt auf der Airbase Rammstein. This is the story of a soldier who operates your nation's Patriot Missile Defense Systems. It begins in California with a little girl raised by two moms. Um, uh, Brie is also the uh, one of the highest ranking transgender service members in the military and is the highest ranking transgender service member in the Department of the Air Force. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, you've been instrumental, as mentioned, in the stand-up of the Space Force. And now you're working to develop these policies and processes that are really going to help the new Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisition and Integration get things moving. So how is that going? It's going really well. It's an amazing opportunity to be part of something where we can help set the process that allows us to remain ahead of our adversaries. You are an inspiration to many. Storybook hours often seek to entertain young children while inspiring a love of reading. But one organization is turning the tables on who's turning the pages. The News Hour's Julia Griffin explains. Too bad, said the stink bug. At the Adams Morgan Community Center in Washington, D.C. recently, parents and their tiny tots sat patiently, riveted by a storybook and its reader. He shuffled into Bear's room. Wake up, Bear, mumbled Mole. Spring is here. This is Drag Queen Story Hour. It's your classic children's reading program with a twist. The day's literary leader is a larger-than-life drag queen. Everybody wave to each other, make a friend next to you, okay? Author Michelle T. first created Drag Queen Story Hour in San Francisco in 2015. God, my path is like a gender queer person. My understanding about gender is that ultimately it doesn't mean anything. People ask you, do you have a boy or a girl? For whatever that means, because this person could be anybody. You hear that right away. You hear like boys are like this and girls are like that. But as soon as we found out that we were having a boy, something just sort of clicked. We have this amazing person and whoever that person is, they're perfect. I'm constantly trying to like queer my relationship with him and get him to wear tutus. He hates it. Like he's just like, no. Our children, they are not really our children. We may thrust them forward into the future, but the course will always be theirs to choose. Every man has a black star, a black star over his shoulder. And when a man sees his black star, he knows his time, his time has come. Black star, don't shine on me, black star. Black star, keep behind on me, black star. There's a lot of living I gotta do
our kids, Caden and Zyler, are three and a half years old, and we're raising them using they, them, their gender neutral pronouns so that they can decide for themselves uh, when, if, and how they want to identify as a gender. You're a boy, right? No. I'm a girl. Who told you you were a girl? Mommy. <clears throat> when did she tell you you were a girl? Because I love girls. Oh, I see. So mommy told you you were a girl? Uh-huh. Um, any, does mommy um, do anything else like with a girl with you? Mm-hmm. Like what? Like chocolates. What, what does she do? She do comes in on me. She puts dresses on you? Oh, wow. This is video posted by Jeffrey Younger, a North Texas father who says his child, who was born as a boy, should live as a boy. But the child's mother, pediatrician Andrew Julas, says their child presents as a girl. He's enrolled in school under a fake girl's name, and uh, his teachers and everyone says he is a girl. The parents have been fighting a legal battle for years, until this week, when a jury granted the mother sole custody. But outside the courtroom, this case has taken on a life of its own. The central question being, should a seven-year-old live as a boy or as a girl? You've been a boy and a girl. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess. <laughs> What's it like? Well, I don't know. You kind of have an image of what being a boy and being a girl is like, but when you actually experience it, it's very different. It's nice to be able to buy shoes now because I couldn't buy the women's shoes because I'm too big. Born oh, a boy, shoes. Patrick spent the last two years living as a girl. Do you need shoes for school? Now, at 14, he's decided he's a boy after all. Something like that. Yeah. But there's a constant reminder of his life as a female. Tell me if you're uncomfortable, but you've grown breasts, haven't you, as a result of the hormone therapy that you were being given? Yeah, so I just started developing like a girl would, and which was the thing that I wanted at that time, but now that's not so helpful. Bruce Reimer was a boy born in Winnipeg, Canada, alongside his twin brother Brian on August 22, 1965. As the twins started growing, they showed some problems urinating due to phimosis, a condition in which foreskin cannot be pulled back off the head of the penis. When the boys were seven months old, their parents Janet and Ronald Reimer took them to get circumcised in order to fix the problem. What the parents didn't know was that the doctor in charge of the circumcision was using a method of cauterization, a burning technique, instead of a traditional blade. During the procedure, Bruce Reimer suffered a horrible accident which resulted in his penis being burnt off. His parents were devastated by this, and after hearing of their son's accident, they decided against having his brother Brian circumcised, whose phimosis later cleared on its own. While questioning whether or not their son would be happy as a male with no penis, their mother happened to be watching a show on television that featured a psychologist named Dr. John Money, who specialized in biology of gender and sexual identity. He appeared charismatic, intelligent, and confident, and he was also well respected and reputable in his field by his peers. He had a theory that gender was not something you were born into, but something learned through socialization and upbringing. The parents felt this was the answer to their son's problem, so they contacted Dr. Money and told him of their situation. Dr. Money invited them to Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore to meet with him. After discussing the matter, the doctor convinced the parents that it would be in their son's best interest to raise him as a girl. So it began, that while his brother Brian was raised like a boy, Bruce was raised as a girl and was given the new name Brenda. At 22 months old, his testicles were removed, he was given dolls and other girlish toys to play with, pretty dresses to wear, and as instructed, they did not tell Brenda about his accident. He and his brother would both go to yearly appointments to see Dr. Money so he could keep watch on Brenda's progress. It's worth mentioning that the twins were a perfect experiment for him to test his nurtured not natured theory, given the circumstance that there were two of them from the same genes for him to compare to each other. However, some issues arose. His parents and the doctor could see that he was showing more masculinity than he was feminine qualities. 
His brother Brian would share his toys with Brenda, because Brenda was happier playing with things boys played with, and playing games that boys normally played. Brenda showed no sign of feeling like a female. If Brenda didn't fully accept being female as his identity, it would disprove Dr. Money's theory and his book about gender being a result of social construction. At seven years old, the boys started to be subjected to more sexualized experiments, like being asked what the differences are between boys and girls, and taught the sexual roles played by men and women. The doctor would make them role-play the positions themselves, like Brian standing behind Brenda and leaning his crotch against his brother's behind. He would also force the boys to inspect each other's genitals. On one occasion, he had the children undress and took nude photographs of them. If the children did not do as asked, the doctor would yell at them, to the point where they thought they would be struck. The children did not like the sessions with the doctor, but they didn't tell their parents what was going on. It was also around this age, Dr. Money tried talking Brenda into going through an operation that would completely change his parts to what he told Brenda they were supposed to look like, like a girl. This time, the parents felt it was best to tell their sons the truth. Ron took Brenda out for ice cream, while Janet took Brian elsewhere so they could individually tell their sons the truth that Brenda was actually born a boy. Brenda, after being told that he was actually born a male, felt immense relief. He felt like himself and he was happy. His brother, however, could not handle the situation and took great shock to the news that his sister was actually his brother. The events surrounding Brenda caused a mental disturbance in Brian Reimer that would eventually lead to schizophrenia and his detachment from his brother. Brenda was ready to take on his new life and renamed himself David. Before he was excluded by the kids in school for his differences, teased and tormented, and felt different from everyone. Now he started making friends, had positive thoughts about the future, and embraced his identity as a boy. He started taking testosterone supplements to counteract the effects of estrogen hormones that the doctor had given to him over the years. This led to him getting a double mastectomy to remove his hormone-induced female breasts, and two phalloplasty operations to recreate his penis. He also received a sum of money for the botched circumcision. Eventually, David met a woman named Jane Fontaine who had three children. They fell in love, got married, and David was happy with his new life. Things seemed to be looking up for him. However, things changed when David heard that Dr. Money was informing people that his experiment with David wanting to be a girl was a success, and nothing could be further from the truth. This caused David to get a hold of his brother so they could speak out against the doctor in the hopes of keeping other children from having to go through what he did. Brian agreed, and they opened up to the world about the truth of their history with Dr. Money. Later, in 2002, Brian Reimer was found dead after overdosing on antidepressants. Aside from David having to deal with his brother's death, he was conned out of $65,000 in a bad deal and was having trouble finding work. He was also having problems with his marriage, in which his wife asked for separation time. On May 2, 2004, David sawed off the end of a shotgun and drove to a nearby grocery store where he shot himself in the head. He was 38 years old when he took his life. Satan is having an affinity towards the exceptions rather than the rules, the abnormalities in favor of the normal. The Satanic Temple is a non-theistic religious organization. We renounce supernaturalism, but we still feel that we are every bit as much a religious entity as any other religious entity. And we fight for our deeply held values. We are Satanists. We engender moral, spiritual, and sexual freedom, personal independence, and insist upon personal choice in all things. Art and aesthetics is very important to modern Satanism. The Dragon Lady is a former banker, 55. Eva Tiamat Medusa was born a man, now lives as a woman and has undergone extensive surgery to transform into the Dragon Lady. Uh-huh. Over the last decade, Tiamat has had roughly $70,000 worth of surgery to fulfill her dream of becoming a dragon. My name's Farah. I am a trans woman, as well as an intersex woman. My pronouns are she, her, they, them, or your grace. 
Uh, my eyes are tattooed. My nose is a piercing. I identify as a threat, a nightmare, and a goddess, so please bow down to me. I do not believe in God, I don't worship the devil, but yes, I am a Satanist, which means I am my own god and I worship myself. Thank you, have a good day.